Welcome and my name is J. Devika from Center for Development Studies. The title of my talk in this series is Rethinking Development Civil Society in Kerala, Taking Women's Empowerment Seriously in Pandemic Times. Now, uh, one of the most important aspects of better preparedness for development emergencies that has marked Kerala in the recent decade is no doubt the availability of a very large civil society around development, which is centered upon the state. Now, studies have shown that in general, social capital is plentiful in Kerala, especially in the forms of community organizations and the various cultural networks that they enable, including libraries, reading rooms, sports organizations, uh, arts organizations and uh, prayer groups and microfinance and so on. There is a very large civil society in that sense, which is actually um, sponsored by various community organizations, religious organizations and so on. And of course, also some political parties. Political parties also have these civil social wings. Now, the civil society that I'm talking about is distinct from these. It's distinct in that it, it is actually a network of women's self-help groups, a very dense and extensive network of women's self-help groups, popularly known as the Kudumbashri Network, uh, which extends the length and the breadth of the state and includes a very large proportion of the Kerala's folk. There are sections, of course, who are outside it or are not adequately covered uh, by it or, or are not adequately active on it. Yet, it is, uh, it is undeniable that this network is a very large uh, uh, source of labor on which the local government can draw in times of need. And this labor is largely female. So, uh, you know, it's, in, it's important, this, uh, this fact of, this, of the development civil society being largely female is something we need to take seriously because the other civil society that I, I mentioned is often male and, and they decide independently what events they want to participate or not. So those groups, for example, uh, reading libraries, youth clubs and so on, are very often very active in uh, flood relief and pandemic uh, relief and so on. They, they, they work locally as volunteers and this is true. Nevertheless, they also um, choose to work for temple festivals and other religious and caste-based uh, occasions as well. The development civil society, however, is usually focused on governmental labor and is uh, closer to the local self-government than any other group. So the immense network of women's SHEC, we all know, Paskur Mishri was begun under the ages of the state poverty alleviation mission. Uh, and it, in the new millennium, these women have been mobilized very effectively, efficiently as we know, to meet a variety of development emergencies. So we have seen uh, that say, for example, in the Chikungunya epidemic of 2007, the Kurumashri women in the panchayat, the three-tier structure of, of the Kurumashri in the panchayats, were extremely active in dealing with the epidemic, especially in clearing uh, vector uh, breeding areas. And so on. Very arduous work was undertaken by them, often uh, at a very low wage or, you know, a, a, a absolute pittance as reward. Um, these women were found engaging in a very arduous labor, such as cleaning vector breeding areas. Uh, and you know that chikungunya mosquito, the vector uh, is very important. Uh, they are, and, and this is absolutely very laudable. And, and of course, there are also um, there are many many instances where Kurumashri women actually work voluntarily, uh, which are not dangerous. Like for example, the district youth festivals state youth festivals and so on are, are, are occasions on which uh, Kudumashri women in many places have contributed voluntary labor, even voluntary uh, resources for meals, etc. Community kitchens, that is. So, um, now this is 
interesting and and important but then i how they how this would appear if we were to take a rights based approach to welfare in development emergencies is an important question this is not something we can ignore just because the kurumashri's work has been so wonderful and so useful to all of us this question especially is it becomes especially important when we take into account the fact that the kurumashri has always rested, rested on the discourse of women's empowerment and we know that now that the discourse of women's empowerment was widely perceived as the way to get the women women's rights into the development agenda throughout the 1990s and after therefore a rights based perspective a rights based response towards securing the well being of women uh, as persons as independent selves in the development civil society will have to go beyond simply plaudits and it will also have to aim at gender justice that empowers women in and through the kurumashri so this is a this is something that is not really negotiable okay? if we are still talking about kurumashri as the vehicle of women's empowerment now to briefly uh, share some thoughts about uh, the discourse of empowerment women's empowerment if you look at the literature there is widespread uh, disappointment among scholars especially feminist scholars in development about how the empowerment agenda has worked out in practical terms since the early years of the new millennium scholars point out that it was it has been reduced to a set of narrow instrumentalist goals yeah what one such scholar andrea conwall Uh, in an essay that she wrote in with a, with a co-author in 2015, uh, uh, she she says that uh, this this whole exercise of women's empowerment, uh, I quote, has ended up making women work for development rather than making development work for their equality and empowerment. This statement is worth quoting another time. So once more, so I'm. or it once more making women work for development rather than making development work for their equality and empowerment further governments which took up the women's empowerment agenda did not really insist on gender equality and justice as indivisible parts of women's empowerment so women may be given a chance to or to wield power so some amount of power may be shared to say for example the reservations of 33% reservation in the panchayats or in kerala's case the women's development uh, women's component plan in panchayats uh, and and many may may actually wield a key role in local governments like the kurumashri actually does but none of this means equal access to power and resources at that level no equal access to higher level of politics as we are seeing in kerala now in kerala there is can be little doubt that women play a very very important role in local governments as elected members and in the kurumashri but we see very few of them actually make it to the higher levels of politics the numbers of women who are successful successful in high politics has not grown it has actually fallen so in other words structural issues that prop up uh, gender inequalities are not really addressed in gender empowerment uh, a, a pra- practical uh, exercises that we have seen in different countries and that includes kerala as well so what we call strategic gender interests are rarely addressed and they are treated generally as either secondary or non actionable now this applies to as i i said just mentioned to kurumashri it is true that very many individual women have been empowered by the by the kes no doubt a uh, lot of young women that i know yeah now not so young women uh, who they were younger when they started out uh, these ha- these women have gained tremendous amounts of experience uh, uh, in 
uh, in and through Kudumbashree. They have built networks of contacts outside their, their families, their communities, their villages. Many have actually uh, gained uh, entry into local politics, though so not many of them have. <laughs> not many of them have gained entry into high politics, but there can be no doubt that many, many of these women have actually entered politics at the local level. And uh, within Kurubishri, of course, there was some effort uh, in the um, uh, towards the end of the first decade of the new millennium to make Kurumashri more empowering to women in the sense of addressing strategic gender interests. So the bylaw of 2008, for example, which enabled internal elections was a very, very important step. So it gave women the experience of campaigning uh, of, for elections and, and coming uh, being elected to the posts of the CDS chairperson, for example, by the local women was definitely a far more empowering experience than simply getting nominated by the local panchayat committee. So the clarification, also the clarification of the role and past of the Kudumbashri functionaries vis-a-vis -vis the local government and the rural development bureaucracy was also very empowering, no doubt. Today, Kudumbashri is the default option for married women. Married women of, say, around the age of, of 30 and above, uh, seeking a public life. These women have Kurumashri as the default arrangement. Also, there's, there is much empowerment that the Kurumashri facilitated, uh, but which was not really planned. So these are unintended consequences. And of course, the most prominent of these consequences is the entry of women into politics rather than just into the market. Now, however, there are a couple of things that, that we have to really not dismiss when we take in this relatively uh, positive and rosy picture. First, it is difficult to deny that the kind of labor women perform in the Kurumashri has not has uh, this labor has hardly challenged any gender stereotype of women's labor. So indeed, much praise is heaped on the Kurumbashri for precisely adhering to stereotypical uh, understandings of women's labor. Women as motherly, responsible, caring, you know, hardworking selfless uh, people. That is really uh, sometimes the message that is conveyed by the Kudumashri's almost ceaseless labors, especially during the time of development emergencies. Secondly, it is quite rare for Kudumashri women to secure an income that is adequate, sufficient, uh, for, to secure, you know, for them to gain a place uh, and a sustainable voice within their families and their community. It's true that many grew, many of the Kudumbachi micro-enterprises are successful. Many of the joint liability groups engaged in farming are also successful and women do secure an income from them. But it is not clear how this, how, how this income is actually secured in the sense that one wonders if women actually cost their labor uh, in a proper way. One also wonders whether this income secured is large enough for them to gain a, a real voice in within even within their family. So no doubt that even a small income is valuable. That is beside the point. But the, then the question is, is this sufficient? I mean, in a state where a domestic worker who, who works like three, two to three hours in a, in a home can uh, get um, an income up to 5,000 rupees more. Um, is the uh, JLG group woman's income of say 2,000 rupees a month good enough to compare the labor, the time that the woman has to devote? Assuming that both women share the same kinds of domestic responsibility. 
Now, thirdly, there is the problem of the structural foundation of the food machine. Now, markedly, uh, it is a liberal uh, organization. It's founded on liberal understandings of welfare. So, the in a neighborhood group, which is the fundamental unit of the food machine, the welfare, the collective welfare of the group is understood as the sum total of the welfare of the families that take part in the group. Now, so that is that makes it easy to see why the food machine uh, does not deliver much on struct on the a uh, strategic gender interest. This structure allows for a notion of collective interest to be articulated, which need not be any kind of a challenge to gender injustice. Indeed, many Kudumbashri women are very strongly conservative. Even many of the Kudumbashri's counsellors, um, you know, often speak an extremely conservative language. There is, and of course, espouse uh, the early marriage of daughters and so on. So, um, you know, in, in that sense, unless, um, you know, and, you know, given the fact that it is, uh, the collective interests are understood as interests of a group of families and of course a patriarchal family then in that case uh, the patriarchal family structure is really not being questioned so um and of course i can imagine uh, many came you know a lot of responses to this point saying that then women did challenge patriarchy here or there and many such empirical instances might be quoted here but and I still would argue that those have to be accounted for by looking at the contingent conditions in those places. Not really by the, it is, there is nothing really in the structure of Kudumashri that makes it imperative for it to challenge patriarchy, especially patriarchal family relations with any seriousness and with any assistance. That's the point. And, uh, uh, a rights-based approach um, would then take these these foundational issues, flaws, very seriously. Because, as I told you, the, the state's success in dealing with development emergencies lies in, in a very large measure on its ability to draw on this cheap and ever-present development labor. That is in the Kurumish. It is available within the Kurumish. Now, if the state is doing that, then it is, it, it, uh, the, I think, right space approach would insist that these women are properly rewarded. Their labor, their work is recognized as labor. This is very, very important. Because, uh, precisely because the development emergencies that we have faced since the early years of the new millennium seem to be demanding more and more governmental and development labor in public, the use of women, in Kurumashri women, as cheap governmental labor may be more and more of a mounting injustice. Many women readily engage in it because this provides them with the joy of public existence, however limited it may be. And the, but then if the labor component begins to exceed the public component, then there could be more and more exploitation than empowerment to the Kurumish. So, so then, if that is the case, then how then to turn to a rights-based approach that will take seriously the promise of women's empowerment through participation in development? I have three suggestions to make here. First, there must be the explicit admission that Kurumashri women are not merely volunteer, that they are engaged in labor. The transformation of women's labor has been an important aspect of Kerala's social life in the turn of the century. Women's domestic labor has changed drastically in a migration-dependent economy, exporting human power, skilled human labor. Uh, and women now perform 
more and more of effective labor at home that involves persuasion and monitoring of children especially for higher education preparing them for entrance exams uh, the whole re the regime of higher education that which would guarantee the transformation of children into skilled docile labor available for the global job market now we see that the governmental labor that women perform in the kudumbashri has a distinct and prominent component of effective labor especially during the lockdown emergencies when they have to actually approach uh, the community home by home house by person by person persuade them to follow the rules to be alert to government directives this is not just sharing communication this is not sh just sharing information passed on by the government this is actively persuading people to obey the government so uh, uh, we are actually seeing kudumbashree women performing this role more and more we saw that during the the floods now we are seeing it during the pandemic of course this is besides doing the more um, a uh, more common um, more familiar role like for example cooking in the community kitchens and so on. now this work is no longer significant to just the local community and this is very very important whether it is especially for a pandemic if a local community does not control the spread of the virus in it it will affect the entire state so the work that these women are doing now it's not merely to do with just a panchayat or just a ward it has a significance for the entire state and which means that with the frequency of development emergencies and uh, emerging and of course there is no way we could rule out another pandemic somewhere uh, you know in the next in the in the, uh, in the future uh, even if we manage to control this virus completely so given the fact that development emergencies are going to be ever more frequent uh, we actually need a state wide caring labor force now that is really the need of the hour and we need to recognize that the kudumbashri women are precisely that labor force that labor force is already there and we are using it and we have to accept them as labor rather than just labeling them volunteers and really not paying them anything substantial a recognition of this labor should translate into some kind of a basic minimum income in the future however small it may be because research does show that of all the resources that are needed for uh, women's empowerment an independent income that they control on their own is the most it's high time that we began to recognize uh, kudumbashri women's governmental labor as labor which deserves Uh, at least a minimal recognition from the state this is the first suggestion i have to make for uh, uh, carving a rights based approach to the uh, to women's labor in development now second this my second point is about the need to radically transform the kudumbashri network now we need in other words to to very urgently expand the development civil society now during the floods as well as the pandemic the government tried to do precisely this through setting up a portal and online registration of volunteers now it's also doing it now now i that's not what i mean that is a limited way of involving people uh, in development but if you're talking about a development civil society then the involvement has to be more of a campaign based one and it has to call upon the discourse of citizenship not just volunteering and charity and so on so um uh, we need to make sure that the development society development civil society that is a good industry is sufficiently expanded and transformed so as to attract and include the many sections of the marginalized people Now this is actually, you know, to think about it, it is already happening in a limited way, in, but in an organic way. The Kudumbashri responds to the diversity of demands from the ground. 
So we have, for example, some initiatives to address our, the, the problems of uh, Kerala's tribal people. So there is there are some tribal projects that Kutu Mishri is doing, which is quite unlike its um, main concerns. They also have groups for aged people. Uh, senior citizens groups, which also have a different set of uh, activities. Uh, they are also men's groups, men activity groups. So um, this uh, development, I'm arguing, should be more consciously pushed and in a more calibrated kind of way. Now, if you ask which groups have to be included, my first choice would be young women. Now, Kudumbashi is the default choice of women who are married. Often young, agreed, maybe 25, 26, with one child, or even before that, but nevertheless, usually married. Now, Kudumbashi needs to think of bringing in young women in a large way. Now, of course, there are a lot of young women who are working with Kudumbashi in some capacity or other. Many are receiving skill training. Uh, many are working along with their mothers and aunts, etc., various capacities in, in groups. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about involving women in a way, young women in a way that gives them a public life. Right now in Kerala, young women, especially of the Dalit and Adivasi communities, are the most disabled. They have no public life. Their employment prospects are very poor. Even education prospects are low. Uh, they bear the brunt of Kerala's terribly persistent and ever-changing patriarchy. In fact, the kind of violence that young women have been facing in Kerala in recent times is extremely worrying. One way to initiate some kind of an, uh, an entry of these women into other spaces, uh, that is spaces outside their community and family, is to draw them into the development civil society. Now, this, of course, will involve many changes, very important changes, and those are very important. And these have to be thought through very carefully, but for now, I'm just flagging this point of making sure that Kudumbashri should be extended in a way that young women find some space there. Now, secondly, uh, the tribal Kudumbashri, you know, which is um, a different, as uh, we all know, the tribal Kudumbashri is not the same as the uh, the mainstream. Now, let's do that in a more focused way. Let's think of a Kudumbashri that suits the interests of ecosystem peoples that will not rest on savings and credit, but maybe on, say, food security. Let's also think about a Kudumbashri that can actually mobilize, for example, the skills of migrant workers. Migrant workers in Kerala, as we all know, are, are uh, you know, not devoid of skills. Some of them are very, very resourceful farmers, for example. So how can the uh, skills of migrant laborers, who otherwise would be completely marginal in, in Kerala society, be drawn into our development civil society? Now again, I don't have, if you ask me how this can be done, I have no instant answers. But I'm quite certain that we can think through it and come up with viable ways to do it. Thirdly, and, and my third point is about Kudumbashri becoming, uh, the, taking up the leadership of transforming the panchayats, in fact strengthening the panchayats uh, into uh, sites of knowledge production. Okay, once it was, we know that in, in the late 1990s, the panchayats uh, formed the core of the panchayat development report, the whole process of the production of the Panchayat Development Report. It was actually produced from and through the Grama Sabhas. Now, that is a process that we seem to have forgotten, but for a rights-based approach, we need to revive it in a very serious way and immediately. Now, for example, if you think about the floods, the, the uh, 2018 floods, now, the ideal way to go about it, because this was an unprecedented experience, uh, we were not prepared for it. We had the best way to go about it was to learn the maximum from it, and the best way to get to uh, obtain a maximum knowledge of the floods was to use the grammar sabhas and produce uh, disaster survival reports, detailed 
the disaster survival reports on each panchayat and then to build the disaster management reports reports on it however we we our styles have changed uh, post 2000 so now we have authorities and missions that are above the panchayats who will then um, you know commission reports from the panchayats so these are not democratic exercises these are bureaucratic these are technocratic exercises I'm not saying they are uh, not valuable. Yeah, they may be valuable. They may have valuable information and insight, but they are simply not democratic. And it is very, very hard to think that they will be really rooted in an understanding of citizens as producers of knowledge. So Kudumbashi can really take this forward in a very important way. So in conclusion, I would like to stress that the recognition of governmental labor the real inclusion of marginalized communities in Kerala's development civil society and creating the conditions for democratic knowledge production at the, uh, in, at the level of the panchayat are probably the ways forward a, for towards a, a rights-based approach. That will initiate conditions in which, under which women's empowerment will become a real possibility uh, uh, in Kerala through uh, women's participation in development. So um, here empowerment would then mean not just individual women being empowered, but groups, you know, even as the leadership of civil, the development civil society. Also empowerment experienced by many women in the Kudumbashri is now relative to their peers. And very often this is contingent on their subordination to their superiors in the local government or the local politics or in the Kudumbashri bureaucracy. Now, the democratic expansion of the Kudumbashri would also trigger the need for more forums of internal discussion and coordination such that internal inequalities do not mar its smooth function. All of this, of course, may be neutralized. I'm not denying that. All three uh, suggestions that I have made may well be neutralized to different forms of political capture and one is certainly no longer romantic over the prospects of local governance. However, with political will, it is not impossible, especially with the pressure from Kerala's oppositional civil society that can scarcely be ignored and can be actually ignored only at our own peril. Thank you very much.